swine-it. It's time for a new era of communication in the swine industry, one that you can get the latest updates while commuting or driving to farms. Here, you will have the brightest minds of the global swine industry in your pocket. These algorithms are really oftentimes much better than humans at finding patterns um, from massive amounts of data. And so one algorithm predicts mortality events a week in advance, and it warns users that they're going to have a problem a week ahead of, of these mortality events happening. And Swine It podcast is only possible with the support of forward-looking and innovative sponsors like NutriQuest, experts serving producers and delivering breakthrough solutions. Genesis, the first power in genetics. Zinpro, essential trace minerals, exceptional performance. Every Pig, a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool. Just All, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Welcome to Swine Eat Podcast. My name is Marcel Gonçalves, your host for today's episode. This episode's sponsor highlight is about every pig. The truth is precision swine production is not the future, it is the present. Every pig is the intelligent pig health platform. It is a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool. Request a free 20 minute demonstration at www.everypig.co slash swine it. Hello everyone, today we have Chris Bongers with us and the title of today's episode is Telemedicine, Artificial Intelligence and Managing Change in Pig Production. So, how are you Chris? I'm doing great, thanks for having me. I appreciate your time and uh, as always, if you want to share uh, your career so far and also how you got involved in pig production. Okay, yeah, well I'd have to go back a long ways. Um, to think about the first time that I was involved in pig production, it was probably on my grandparents' farm in northwest Iowa um, when I was about as old enough to walk, I guess. Nice. But um, I grew up with a, a veterinarian father who started the Orange City Veterinary Clinic, and um, he really brought me along for a lot of the practice, and um, I got a real opportunity to see him grow his practice and business over the years. and work in the vet clinic as well growing up and then later in life after I uh, graduated college I studied international business so I never really thought that I'd be getting into agriculture um, but a couple years after college my dad had started owning pigs with his farmer customers in the area that were having a hard time staying in business mm -hmm. it was really a point where they needed to get big and get more efficient or they weren't going to be able to stay um, in business anymore. And so my dad started owning some pigs with farmers in Northwest Iowa. And I saw a business model and uh, that I, I really thought was great and I could help grow. And so I focused 10 years um, working with him at RC Family Farms, um, really growing the business a lot. That was my main focus. And that's kind of what led into the software. I learned about a lot of the problems in the industry, uh, in particular, companies not being aware of their animal health problems quick enough. And, and so that's when I started down the path of software. Very cool, very cool. Um, and uh, well, one thing uh, you and I were chat, chatting before the, the podcast was about telemedicine. So what is it and how can it be of benefit in the age of coronavirus and uh, African swine fever? Yeah, so I, I didn't come prepared with a definition of telemedicine, so I don't have that, <laughs> I don't have that in front of me, and I'm sure they, they can define it in quite a few different ways. But right. um, one way I would look at it is just using existing technologies to practice um, veterinary medicine. So mm -hmm. it might be through um, video, through photos, through platforms that have structured data, so veterinarians can view historical records in a digitized form from wherever they're at and also not have to potentially travel to as many of these farms physically anymore, um, which will help biosecurity, number one. Mm -hmm. um, and it will also help save these veterinarians time and help them respond to issues quicker because they're going to be able to cover many more cases every day using software platforms than they are in that traditional way of having to go out and visit every farm individually. Cool. And uh, 
change a little bit of, of subject here um, and uh, and I appreciate that background on, on that and that makes total sense to me now uh, if you think about antimicrobial resistance and all the discussions around it um, what is your take on it and where do you think it's going you know the industry's really taken a stance of saying that there's no direct connection between antibiotics in pigs and um, antimicrobial resistance in humans. And there are a number of large organizations um, that believe the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that we're looking at it from a, a practical standpoint, understanding the, the pork producers that say, hey, we believe in antibiotic stewardship and being responsible, um, not over medicating, um, we think the, the first step to any change is, is really awareness and tracking. And the reality is most companies have little to no idea about what amount of antibiotics are being given on their farms. And the reason for that is because they haven't been collecting this in any sort of structured data. What we believe in is really showing people these are the amount of antibiotics that you're using mm -hmm. and these are maybe your farms where you're overusing mm -hmm. and farms where you're underusing but as well as that um, we're focused on doing things that keep animals that may have been given antibiotics recently out of the food supply mm -hmm. so with digitized records users are able to see when a group of pigs may be violating antibiotic withdrawal periods and cancel those loads from getting to market. Mm -hmm. Very cool. These are a couple of ways I think um, digital records and, and technology is going to be able to really help our industry stay more compliant. Very, very nice. Yeah, that's definitely something big. And, and like you said, different countries are at different uh, levels or maturity of that uh, change. Uh, that makes sense. Now, on, um, as I think about technology and the digital age now, uh, how does that tie together with the you know, rural veterinary shortage? Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I, I touched on that a little bit earlier. I think we notice veterinarians on telemedicine platforms mm -hmm. are able to cover 50 or 100 cases a day. And veterinarians driving from farm to farm might be able to cover a handful of farms at most in a day um, where they're really not able to practice as stringent biosecurity protocols as they maybe should. But the fact of the matter is it's just faster and it's a better use of veterinary time to be using their veterinary brain power on more cases mm -hmm. versus spending time driving out to farms. Mm -hmm. um, that's really not a very good use of their time anymore. So I think you're going to see faster response times um, from the top veterinarians. I think they're going to be able to cover more and more areas. Every single pork producer that I've spoken to over probably the last 10 years has said that you know they feel they're having a hard time recruiting top veterinarians. No one wants to go and live in their small community in Nebraska or Iowa, they say, and, and they're, they're really... Um, at a loss for that veterinary brain power they need. But technology, specifically telemedicine platforms, are going to allow some of these veterinarians to maybe live in Chicago and service customers all over the country, but they get to live and practice from wherever they're at. And I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunity and it's going to improve um, transparency and response times to a lot of the health issues that we see in our, our population. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah, I never thought about that that way. That makes that makes sense. It's it's definitely a, a rapidly changing uh, environment. One question I have, Chris, is uh, as you discuss with producers, I mean, what what are your thoughts as far as how folks manage change, you know, throughout uh, the pig production system? Yeah, I think for anyone innovating in our industry, we need to take very seriously change management and how challenging that can be in organizations and more specifically in our industry. We're dealing with many different um, people that oftentimes have been working in a position for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And those people may have been doing a lot of things wrong for 20 years, but they tend to really have their monopoly of data and, the, and information in the company. 
And oftentimes those are the people that are afraid of any new system. And oftentimes those are the people that are holding companies back from growth and transparency. And so I think the psychology behind recognizing who that person is in every organization because they all have one or two um, and, and dealing with them and helping show them as an educator, and I think um, shrinking the change, helping people understand, you know, things like these algorithms aren't out to replace veterinarians. They're out to assist veterinarians. Um, they will be able to do some of the things veterinarians do, but that will allow them to evolve in their thought process and what they're focused on as well. So I think it's very important to take a look at, you know, where, where innovators are spending their time. Not all organizations are ready for their change yet, and, and some are, and you have to really help educate them about how to make the change as frictionless as possible. And that's a whole different skill set usually than creating these products. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there's definitely value to experience, right? But the, there's also that moment where, hey, uh, <laughs> You know, we live in a different age now and things need to move uh, a little faster. So how about artificial intelligence, right? This is a buzzword now, I, I probably as big, well, not as big as microbiome in, uh, in the pig side of things, but definitely bigger than it uh, in other industries. Yeah. Uh, um, so how about that in pig production? You know, what's the current status and, and where is it going? So... Yeah, you're right. Artificial intelligence is a big buzzword that um, we've all seen defined in quite a few different ways. But the way I kind of think of it is really computer code doing um, human-like tasks and learning to teach itself. And these algorithms is what they are, complex algorithms, are really oftentimes much better than humans at finding patterns. Um, from massive amounts of data. And so one algorithm that we've had for a while predicts mortality events a week in advance. And it warns users that they're going to have a problem a week ahead of, of these mortality events happening. And we recently ran some data, some trials, and we found out that algorithm was over 99.6% accurate. Mm -hmm. And the human veterinary feedback um, had been oftentimes that uh, they were telling the algorithms, no, they were wrong. And they were telling the algorithms oftentimes that it wasn't useful. Um, and then when we went back and did the back testing, we found out, in fact, that algorithm was right almost every single time. The humans just didn't want to be told that or they weren't seeing um, what the algorithms were seeing. And it's understandable. Many of these veterinarians have you know, somewhere between a million or even two million pigs that are somewhat under their care. Mm -hmm. And that may be on 500 farms. Right. And those might be with a bunch of different owners. And it, humans don't have time to go through everyone's daily checkup and look at every checkup from the past every day and never forget any of those scenarios and correlations. So I think the state of artificial intelligence in our industry it's already here. The artificial intelligence is here. We see it in our platform every day in, in three different algorithms. One of them's making post-mortem diagnosis um, mm -hmm. from photos. We're, we're being careful to, to not call them you know, any sort of official diagnosis. What they are is they're making suggestions from, mm -hmm. from patterns, but they're able to recognize over 22 illnesses already Oh wow! with a high degree of accuracy now. So I think the state of artificial intelligence is in our industry is far beyond our industry's understanding and willingness to adapt to that technology. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, so, so now let me just uh, step back a little bit um, and uh, maybe just make sure everyone understands. So when you are talking algorithm, right, what does that mean, right? Yeah, so basically, um, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a computer scientist, that's not my background, <laughs> uh, but the way that I like to think of it, it's just a simple set of rules. Mm -hmm. Got it. And the good thing about computers is they will follow those rules that you write, mm -hmm. um, and, and that'll be an interesting thing for artificial intelligence in the future, too, is um, you know, how, how do we regulate artificial intelligence, where are the thresholds or parameters we want to put around it. 
But that's going to be much more uh, a debate on the human side than it is for the algorithms because those rule changes are actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. And and the algorithms will follow those rules, unlike humans oftentimes that we we don't like to follow rules necessarily some of the time. Um, So that's, that's kind of how I think of it. Okay, that's very cool. Now, I uh, still on this topic, and I know it's a little geeky, but I, I kind of uh, curious about it. What's the difference of that in machine learning, or is there machine learning side of it, or how does that all tie together? <laughs> I'm not the person to dive into this area, uh, okay. but uh, essentially, my understanding of machine learning is, you know, it's a branch of artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there there are things like machine vision uh, as well. Machine learning more often dives through like data, um, machine vision. Some might argue machine vision is a, a machine learning is a part of machine vision. But as you would imagine, vision is trying to teach um, computers to see like humans, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so we're we at every big are practicing um, with machine vision and machine learning. Um, yeah, and then you can get into deep learning and you can get into um, neural nets and, and all that stuff, but that's probably a conversation I should leave up to my data scientist to have at some point. Cool. Cool. That's cool. Very nice. Well, anything else, Chris, uh, before we move to the three questions we ask every guest every episode? I'm ready for the three questions. Let's, let's bring it on. All right. It is time to our famous three. So what's your favorite pig-related book or resource? Uh, there's this incredible uh, organization out there called Swinet, mm-hmm. uh, and I think <laughs> yes. I think they're they're probably the best geared for the things that I'm interested in the industry. Yep, and food disclosure, right? Uh, Chris is one of the supporters of the podcast and, and his company Everpick, so we definitely appreciate that support. But I also appreciate. Uh, you know, you are, uh, you're thinking highly, highly of us. And so, yeah, that's, thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks to you. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be supporting it if we didn't believe in it. And, um, so that's, that's something we've been happy to be a part of. Right. No, I appreciate that. What's your favorite book or resource in general, Chris? My favorite book or resource in general. Wow. That's tough because I like to go through a lot of books. You know, since we've been talking about artificial intelligence so much today, um, one book that comes to mind is um, AI Superpowers. And it's a book on um, China, Silicon Valley, and really how the race for the future is in artificial intelligence. It's already happening and how um, really it's become pretty bipolar in terms of the two superpowers in the area. Mm. And um, I found it to be a fascinating book. So I would definitely recommend that read to anyone that's interested in geopolitics and policies and, and technology and AI. Very nice. Very cool. And last one is, what do you think sets apart successful SWAN professionals from those who are not? I like that question. <laughs> um, and having been a pork producer for 10 years, I can tell you the people that I see moving forward are one thing they always have in common is they realize they don't know it all, but they're bringing good people around them and they're making the people around them better. And so they're constantly learning Mm -hmm. Uh, seems to be the people that are stuck in their own ways and stubborn and not wanting to view things how they are today and think about how they might be tomorrow that, that have a hard time staying with it and succeeding. So I think, Um, The people that really want to continue to learn and grow no matter what level they're at seem to move forward the fastest. Very cool. No, that makes total sense. Yep, that makes sense. You know, I always have to continue to be improving and uh, and, uh, be surrounded by people that make make you improve. So thanks so much, Chris, for your time. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Really appreciate your time here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, and um, I'd love to be back on anytime you want to talk. It's always a fun conversation. Hey, everyone. Please share our episodes with as many people as you can so we can continue to impact the life of swine professionals from around the globe with the wisdom of our great guests. Before you go, make sure to get in our wait list for the Swine Talks Web Conference, the first online conference of the global swine industry, an update on hot topics and we even gonna have some controversial topics of the global swine industry 
so you can leverage that knowledge in your day to day. Go to swinetalks.com and get on our wait list. We'll talk soon.